History, Anti-Semitism, and the Holocaust. Professor Pastone is professor in the Department of History at the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Chicago. He's also the co-director for the Chicago Center of Contemporary Theory. Um, his list of achieve achievements and uh, publications are known widely uh, to many of you. He's uh, published many works on uh, issues dealing, with, for example, his book in 2009, History and Heteronomy, uh, Critical Essays, which is published by the University of Tokyo Center for Philosophy, Marx Reloaded, uh, Repenser, <laughs> what is it? No, it's Spanish. Spanish. Sorry. I don't know. I don't know. Someone who knows Spanish. <laughs> okay, sorry. So he also wrote a book entitled In Greek Essays on Anti Semitism, and also in German, the German volume of essays on, the, on Germany, the Left, and the Holocaust, and in French, um, Anti Semitism and National Socialism. And just as a, as a small footnote, um, when we were setting up the center, your work sort of from a critical perspective of examining anti-Semitism and a historical material reality really inspired me and some of my colleagues. So uh, we never met before, but you should know that you, your, your imprint is here. So it's really honored to know you. Um, thank you. Um, the talk might be a little dense, and if it is, we'll have to just loosen it up in the question and answer session afterwards. Uh, what I'm going to try to do in this talk is relate historical changes in public responses to the Holocaust, especially on the left, to the historically changing configurations of capitalist modernity since 1945. I argue that public responses to the Holocaust have tended to be structured by an opposition between abstract modes of universalism and concrete particularism, and those responses have shifted with the changing configuration of capitalist modernity from a statist configuration of the 1950s and 1960s to a subsequent neoliberal phase. The character of those responses and their relation to the changing configurations of capitalist modernity can be mediated I'm suggesting, by a theory of capital on the one hand and of anti-Semitism on the other. Now, why a theory of capital? Let me begin with an issue of historical periodization. <coughs> the historian Eric Hobsbawm has characterized the 20th century in terms of three overarching periods. The first, from 1914 until after World War II, was what he calls an age of catastrophe, marked by two world wars, the Great Depression, the rise of fascism, Stalinism, and Nazism, and the Holocaust. A so-called golden age followed, lasting until the early 1970s, characterized by high rates of economic growth, the expansion of welfare states, relative political stability, and worldwide processes of decolonization. This period ended in the early 1970s, followed by a new crisis-ridden configuration marked by the increased mobility of capital and labor, growing social differentiation and unemployment, the rise of new centers of capital accumulation, and catastrophic downturns in other parts of the world. This pattern, I suggest, is not simply an imposition by historians on a formless reality, but actually delineates a historical actuality. As many have noted, during the period of post-war prosperity, states engineered stable economic growth and living standards through similar policies, although very different political parties were in power. Subsequently, starting in the 1970s, the welfare state synthesis <coughs> unraveled and rolled back in all states, regardless of which parties were in power. In both periods, the specific policies differed among states, but the tendency was general. These general developments can themselves be seen with reference to a still larger historical pattern 
the rise and decline of the state-centered organization of social and economic life. Its beginnings can be located roughly in the First World War and the Russian Revolution. Its decline can be located in the crisis of the 1970s and the subsequent emergence of a neoliberal global order. This general trajectory was global. It encompassed Western capitalist countries and the Soviet Union, as well as colonized lands and decolonized countries. When viewed with reference to this common trajectory, differences in policies and paths appear as different inflections of a common pattern, rather than as fundamentally different developments. The general character of this large-scale historical pattern suggests the existence of an overarching structure of constraints and imperatives that cannot be explained in local and contingent terms and that seriously restrict human agency. Such a historical pattern, which is a characteristic of modernity, I would argue, should be understood as marking a form of unfreedom. If people really had historical agency, you wouldn't have this kind of pattern. This form of unfreedom, I want to suggest, is the object of a critical theory of capital. Such a critical theory is not focused mainly on issues of class and the unequal distribution of wealth and power, but attempts to ground the historical dynamics of capitalist modernity as one that is constituted by humans and yet is outside of their control. And it's that theme which is going to be crucial for what I'm going to develop. As noted, responses to the Holocaust have been characterized by the opposition of concrete particularity and abstract universality. I've argued elsewhere that this opposition is also constitutive for modern anti-Semitism and that it is intrinsic to the fundamental social forms that structure capitalist modernity. This analysis then grasps both terms of the opposition, abstract universality, concrete particularity, as remaining bound within the framework of the existing order, however much positions based on each of them have understood themselves as fundamentally critical, pointing beyond that order. By suggesting that both sorts of responses remain imminent to capital, this approach can problematize the historical shift that occurred in recent decades from the predominance of critiques based on abstract universalism associated, for example, with classical working class movements to those focused on concrete particularity expressed, for example, by struggles that can be deemed anti-colonial in the broadest sense. Such a shift also marked changing responses to the Holocaust by various movements and positions on the left. This not only reveals the changing character of the left, but also, and I hope to develop this, illuminates its limits in terms of its most fundamental self-understanding as a critique of the capitalist order. What mediates the various moments that I've thrown on the table is the issue of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is frequently and mistakenly understood simply as a form of racism. It does have in common with other forms of essentializing discourse, such as racism, an understanding of social and historical phenomena in innate biological or cultural terms. Unlike most forms of racism that attribute concrete physical and sexual power to the other, that is considered inferior, however, modern anti-Semitism does not treat the Jews as inferior, but as extremely powerful purveyors of evil. Moreover, the power attributed to the Jews is not concrete and physical, but is abstract, universal, intangible, and global. The Jews within this framework constitute an immensely powerful, invisible international conspiracy that seeks to control the world. Far from being a form of prejudice directed against the minority group, modern anti-Semitism provides a framework for understanding the world. 
It purports to explain the modern wor world critically and is characterized by its populist, anti-hegemonic, and anti-global character. As I've argued elsewhere, this worldview misrecognizes the abstract, temporally dynamic global domination of capital, which subjects people to the compulsion of abstract historical forces they cannot grasp directly as the domination of international jewelry. Anti-Semitism then treats the Jews as constituting an evil, destructive power. Within this Manichaean worldview, the struggle against the Jews is a struggle for human emancipation. Freeing the world involves freeing it from the Jews. Extermination, which should not be confused with mass murder, is a logical consequence of this belt and challenge. Because anti-Semitism can appear to be anti-hegemonic and hence emancipatory, it can blur the differences between what I would characterize as reactionary and progressive critiques of capitalist modernity. For this reason, a, a century ago, a social democratic leader, August Babel, purportedly characterized anti-Semitism as the socialism of fools. In its more recent manifestation, it could be characterized as the anti-imperialism of fools. Anti-Semitism fuses the deeply reactionary with the apparently emancipatory in an explosive amalgam. Since 1945, reactions by the left to the Holocaust, the most terrible and consistent expression of anti-Semitism, have tended to shift historically from a position informed by abstract universalism to one marked by a focus on qualitative specificity. Those reactions, however, have rarely dealt with anti-Semitism adequately and hence have rarely grasped the specificity of the Holocaust. Indeed, in various ways, they tend to occlude an adequate understanding. This pattern of changing responses to the Holocaust, however, was not unique to the left. Indeed, it indicates the degree to which left conceptions were very much part of their larger historical context. Let me begin to elaborate this by noting a sea change in interpretations of Nazism after 1945. During the first post-war period, what I earlier referred to as the Golden Age, National Socialism frequently was interpreted as a revolt against modernity. Subsequently, after the 1970s, Nazism became seen as fundamentally modern. This reversal was related to the general issue of how history was understood. I've argued that anti-Semitism understands capital's global dynamic in terms of a global, invisible Jewish conspiracy. This suggests that the anti-Semitic struggle against the Jews can be understood as an attempt to overcome processes of ongoing historical change that seem to be beyond the control of people. Having misrecognized history as constituted by capital in agentive terms, that is, the Jews, anti-Semitism seeks to conquer that history through the assertion of another agency. The struggle against capital becomes cast as a world historical struggle of two different kinds of will. One operates abstractly, is intangible and fundamentally inhuman, that is the Jews. The other is concrete, tangible, and in terms of its own self-understanding, authentically human. This worldview waned during the post-war golden age. Following a transition period marked by increasing repression, which I'll return to, the rapid economic growth of the 1950s and 1960s in both the Keynesian West and the post-Stalinist East appeared to indicate that the long crisis of capitalist modernity finally had been resolved by a successful state-centered synthesis. People, it seemed, had learned to control historical development. 
from the standpoint of this era, history seemed to have been tamed. It no longer posed a threat, but appeared as a positive process, as modern progress. Nazis revolt against, Nazism's revolt against history then could be regarded as anti-modern, as a regression, a German aberration. The apparently linear triumph of modernity in the 50s and 60s was undermined at the beginning of the 1970s. With the crisis of that decade, the historical dynamic of capitalism began to reemerge overtly beyond the control of national state structures. Parallel to this, an intellectual shift also occurred, entailing a critique of what was called the master narratives of modernity, of the universal, and an affirmative turn to particularism. History became revalued as an expression of domination. Within the framework of this shift, Nazism once again became seen as the other of critical discourse, this time as an extreme example of the modern. What is striking about these two widespread understandings is that although opposed to one another, both grasp Nazism as the one-sided opposite of the dominant discourse as anti-modern during a period when affirmations of modernity and modernization were hegemonic, and as modern during the subsequent postmodern <coughs> period. This in turn reveals that the discourses of both modernity and postmodernity are as one-sided, as are typically those of abstract universality and concrete particularity. Like interpretations of Nazism, the non-linear trajectory of Holocaust discourse can be related to the two overarching historical configurations of social life since World War II. As is well known, the Holocaust was discursively marginalized for several decades after 1945. This slowly changed in the course of the 1960s. Since the, early 19, since the late 1960s and early 1970s, the Holocaust in particular and issues of historical memory in general have become increasingly central to public discourse. Let me begin problematizing the relation of this discursive shift to a large-scale historical transformation since 1945 by briefly examining the marginalization of discourse under the Holocaust in the first two post-war decades. On the one hand, it seems very clear that processes of denial and repression played a central role in such marginalization, especially in Germany and Austria. The Cold War also contributed to this marginalization. The recent past was quickly submerged by the new global struggle. Yet however important such processes in development were, they don't fully account for the general discursive situation in both East and West, namely that after 1945, the attempted extermination of Jews as Jews was almost universally ignored. In Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, the centrality of antisemitism to Nazism was completely bracketed. Antisemitism was viewed as a secondary problem, a diversionary tactic. This understanding afforded little conceptual space for dealing with the Holocaust. Hence, the victimization of Jews as Jews was downplayed in the post-war communist world. It's remarkable that although many monuments to the victims of Nazism were erected in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, almost none of them mentioned the Jews. Hence, for example, the massacre of 33,000 Jews in two days in September 1941 by the Nazis and Ukrainian irregulars at Babi Yar, just outside of Kiev, was not commemorated for years. When a monument was erected, it referred to the execution by the German fascist invaders of citizens of Kiev and prisoners of war. Frequently, Jewish victims were only referred to as peaceful Soviet citizens without any other further identification. Even the memorial at Auschwitz referred only to victims of fascism, thereby eradicating the specificity of the Holocaust 
and of the Jews as victims of attempted extermination by dissolving that specificity in abstractly universal categories. When specific classes of victims were named in such memorials, it was either in political terms as anti-fascists or in national terms, Poles, Russians, Czechs, both either excluded the category Jews or at best included it as one of many nationalities that had suffered under the Nazis. One could point to many factors that might help explain the situation in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, including the abstract universalism of communist ideology, according to which a specific focus on the victimization of the Jews would be particularistic, the strong hostility towards any expression of Jewish identity on the part of many communists, as well as willingness on the part of communist ruling elites to curry favor with populations that they suspected remained anti-Semitic. That the Jews were particular targets of genocide was, however, also not generally recognized in the West. This suggests that various local and contingent factors do not sufficiently explain the marginalization of Holocaust discourse during the first two post-war decades. Neither Churchill nor de Gaulle, for example, took cognizance of the centrality of anti-Semitism to Nazism, nor did they pay particular attention to the Jews as Nazism's victims. Instead, they treated the Third Reich as the ultimate expression of Prussian militarism, and they made sure after the war that Prussia was dissolved. In France, in 1948, Le Monde wrote of the 280,000 deportees from France, without mentioning the Jews. A law was passed that year according to which the term deportee was applicable only to those who were deported for political reasons. In fact, the term was also implied to, applied to Jews so that, surreally, Jewish children sent to Auschwitz were described as political deportees. In Alain René's award-winning film, Night and Fog, 1955, political deportees, deportees sent to do forced labor, and Jewish deportees sent to their death are all conflated. The film shows the piles of Jews and other article, of shoes and other articles taken from Jews at Auschwitz, but does so without mentioning the Jews. It could be argued that this complete submergence of the specificity of the Holocaust <coughs> that the Jews were killed as Jews, was the expression of a certain abstract form of universalism that understood itself as the opposite of Nazism and regarded any mention of the Jews as Jews to be unacceptably particularistic. Ironically, it served to, to eradicate the Jews from history again. In the post-war epoch, the universalism that negated the qualitative specificity of the Holocaust was mediated by the national state. This combination was not necessarily stable. From the general standpoint of the nation, the Jews as Jews were particular. Hence, the specificity of the Holocaust was bracketed. On the other hand, during the most virulent phase of the Cold War in the early 1950s, each side viewed itself threatened by a shadowy global conspiracy each camp viewed its foe as pervasive and intangible, that is, abstract. The turn against the universal was expressed by the show trials in Eastern Europe, the so-called doctor's plot in the USSR, and McCarthyism in the United States. In the most famous show trial in East Central Europe, that held in Prague in 1952, 11 of the 14 accused were Jews, including Rudolf Slansky, the Secretary General of the Czechoslovak Communist Party. The charges against them were classically anti-Semitic. The accused were characterized as ruthless cosmopolitans and agents of nefarious international forces, namely the CIA and the Zionists. Unable for ideological reasons to refer to international Jewry, the communist regime used the word Zionism to fulfill the same function. Such accusations became widespread between 1948 and 1953, 
culminating in the uncovering of the so-called doctor's plot in Moscow, a purported international Zionist plot that aimed to poison the Soviet leadership. The regime was making plans for the mass roundup of Soviet Jews and to build camps for them. These plans were then abruptly dropped with the death of Stalin in March 1953. Having first bracketed the Holocaust in the name of universality, the communist world now recapitulated the anti-Semitic attack on Jews as constituting an international conspiracy that posed a danger to humanity. The authorities now termed this conspiracy Zionism. The accusations made were not contingently directed against Jews, but against Jews as the embodiment of an abstract universal conspiracy that would undermine the people's community. At this point, at the latest, the end point of Stalin socialism in one country revealed itself, in essence, as a form of national socialism. Yet this turn against cosmopolitan was not restricted to the Soviet bloc. On a much less terroristic level, with less openly anti-Semitic language, McCarthyism in the United States signaled a similar term against cosmopolitanism against international communism, which frequently was associated with Jews. This anti-cosmopolitanism abated, or was pushed underground, however, after the mid-1950s. With the regularization of the Cold War after 1953, the universal threat perceived by each side diminished. What emerged was a global order structured by competing international blocs, each of which promoted a set of fetishized abstract universal values, freedom versus equality. With all of their differences, both camps based themselves on linear conceptions of progress associated with productivist visions of development in which large-scale bureaucratic organizations mediated production and distribution. That is, in both cases, social organization was seen to be rationally organized according to universal general principle. The post-war synthesis then became associated with purportedly universal values. This began to be called into question in the late 1960s and early 1970s as the post-war order began to unravel. One dimension of this historical shift was political and cultural expressed by the rise of new social movements of racial minorities, students, youth, women, gays, that criticized in the name of qualitative specificity, abstract universality as a mode of domination. It was within this shifting historical context that public discourse began to address the specificity of the Holocaust. This shift began to occur in the early and mid-1960s, signaled by the appearance of a number of novels, plays, and historical works entailing the rise of a politics of recognition. Newer discourses on the Holocaust emerged, which ranged from positions that suggest, at least implicitly, a form of universality that could encompass difference, to discourses that have swung to the other pole and have been very particularistic in their focus on the Holocaust specificity. A similar tension can also be found among a range of newer movements that emerged at the time. Some, such as what at the time were called socialist feminist movements, for example, sought to get beyond the dichotomy of universal and particular, however implicitly. Others, such as black nationalism and many radical feminist groups, simply reproduced it, however, choosing the side of particularism. This has arguably been the case with many varieties of anti-imperialism, which increasingly have valorized the nationalism of groups deemed other as the revolt of authentic, concrete particularity against the homogenizing dynamism of abstract domination. At the same time, such domination has been reified as the domination of the United States and, in many cases, of Zionism. Ironically, then, the same context within which people began to address the Holocaust in qualitatively specific terms 
has also been generative of movements that veering back to a glorification of the concrete have begun to reproduce anti-Semitic motifs. Let me begin to problematize this complex of issues. The break affected by the new social movements of the 1960s and 1970s was related, I would argue, to a historical transformation of the overarching organization of social and economic life. The late 1960s were a crucial moment in this regard, one when the order that had superseded laissez-faire capitalism, the state-centered capitalism, and its statist, actually existing socialist equivalent, ran up against their historical limits and were fundamentally called into question. In this period, students and youth were not so much reacting against exploitation as they were reacting against bureaucratization and alienation. On a general level, such shifts expressed a growing distance from and critique of the affirmation of labor at the heart of traditional working class movements on a more directly political level, such shifts were in part expressions of disillusionment with Soviet communism. The late 1960s then saw a break with the affirmation of abstract universality, particularly in its bureaucratic statist form. This new historical situation suggested the need for a kind of social critique that could be directed against both market media and state-mediated capitalism. Yet rather than trying to rethink the world in these terms and get beyond the opposition of abstract and concrete, many oppositional movements took a turn to the conceptually familiar and focused on concrete expressions of domination, such as military violence or bureaucratic police state political domination. Against the historical background of decolonization and anti-colonial wars, especially in Vietnam, <coughs> anti-colonial struggles now became the primary focus for much of the new land. The concrete nature of such struggles was easy to grasp. Moreover, the struggles of colonized peoples for independence was felt to have an elective affinity with movements that demanded the recognition of particularity, such as those of minorities and women. In this situation, anti-colonialism became a displaced way of expressing a radical critique of capitalist society translated into nationalist and culturalist terms. This became increasingly the case in the course of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s as what was called anti-imperialism changed its character. Let me outline the change. During the Vietnam War, for example, opposition to the American War was seen by many as part of a larger struggle for, for progressive political and social change. The United States was regarded as a conservative force opposed to such change. American opposition to movements of national liberation was criticized particularly strongly precisely because its movements were regarded positively. The Vietnamese NLF was seen not only as an anti-colonial movement seeking to assert national independence, but also as socialists struggling for a progressive future. Regardless of how one judges such positive evaluations today, what characterized the anti-war movements of a generation ago was that opposition to American policy was for many one expression of a more general struggle for progressive change. The more recent anti-war mobilizations against the war in Iraq appear at first glance to be the same, but closer consideration reveals that politically they are quite different. Opposition to the United <coughs> States has not been in the name of a more progressive alternative. If a generation ago, opposition to American policy entailed supporting struggles for liberation considered progressive, today opposition to American policy in and of itself is all too frequently deemed anti-hegemonic. The general idea of progress, of progressive change, has basically been swept away. The notion of resistance, so common in the last three decades, is not the same as that of transformation. A common feature of the newer anti-imperialism 
has been a reified conflation of the abstract and a dynamic domination of global capital with the United States, or at times with the United States and Israel. This conflation goes far beyond the critique of the Bush administration or of Israeli policies. It ironically recapitulates an ideology of 100 years ago in which the subject positions occupied today by the United States and Israel in some forms of anti-globalization were occupied by Britain and the Jews. This ideology, however, of 100 years ago was the discourse of the European right. The similarity between what had been a rightist critique of hegemony and what regards itself as a critique from the left reveal similar fetishized understandings of the world. I'm suggesting then that as the concretistic anti-imperialism of the new left fused with the concretistic form of anti-globalization, its attacks on the abstract and universal increasingly recapitulated earlier anti-Semitic motifs. Now, I, can, I really can't develop that fully, fully, but let me bring up a few points. <coughs> For parts of the new left, the Palestinian struggle beginning after 1967 <coughs> became regarded as the central anti-colonial struggle. What was and is noteworthy is not support for the Palestinian struggle for self-determination and is not criticisms of Israeli policies and institutions. <clears throat> Rather, it is the degree to which much contemporary discourse on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict exceeds the bounds of political and critical analysis. One does not necessarily call into question Palestinian struggles when one notes the degree to which they've become emotionally invested for anti-imperialist groups, especially in Europe, and relatedly how invested the critique of Zionism has become. Zionism is frequently treated as a malevolent global force so immensely powerful that it can even determine the policies of the American superpower. Historically, this form of anti-Zionism, and I don't mean criticism of Israel, can be related to the situation after 1967 when the Soviet Union, reacting to the defeat of its client states, Egypt and Syria, in the June War, lashed out at Israel by drawing on the anti-Semitic motifs formulated earlier during the show trials. The USSR began promulgating a form of anti-Zionism that was essentially anti-Semitic. Zionism as singularly evil, constituting a global conspiracy, so that one of the immediate effects of the war in 1967 were that all communist Jews in Poland were purged as Zionists, people who had been lifelong communists. A further factor in the reemergence of anti-Semitic motifs, of course, has been the spread and growing importance of the anti-Semitic worldview in the Middle East, although this could be changing now. Israeli policies and actions can help explain very strong anti-Israel sentiments, but are not sufficient to explain the emergence in the Middle East of a classically anti-Semitic version of anti-Zionism, of Israel and the Jews as constituting a powerful global demonic power. I'd suggest that these more recent developments could be related to the differential effect globally of the newest configuration of capitalism, of neoliberal globalization. Whereas some countries and areas, especially in East and South Asia, have prospered, others, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, have declined dramatically. Less well known is that the Arabic-speaking Middle East has suffered precipitous economic decline in the last 30 years. It is not immediately obvious why this has been the case. Nevertheless, I would argue that this regional crisis constitutes the background for the growing identification of many in the Middle East with the Palestinians as victims and for the spread of anti-Semitic ideas in that region. The notion that Israel and the United States are responsible for the misere of the Middle East helps make sense of the experience of helplessness in the face of protracted regional decline reinforced by an awareness that some formerly third world countries in other parts of the world have experienced rapid economic growth. 
This widespread ideology, which conflates the differential effects on the Middle East of global capital with the policies of the United States and Israel and with the Jews, has converged with a fetishized form of anti-globalization described above. The Holocaust not only is a stain on European history that cannot simply be washed away and hence in every generation elicits forms of denial, it also disrupts some left understandings of history and politics. In this situation, reductionist left understandings of history and European historical denial reinforce each other. This is particularly the case of the self-styled anti-imperialist left in Europe, which seeks to locate the possibility of anti-capitalism in non-Western nationalist movements. Shorn of any notion of progressive transformation, the defense of such nationalism reveals itself as an expression of conceptual helplessness. Emancipation no longer entails the constitution of a new form of life, and again, that could really be changing right now. But the elimination of the sources of global evil, Zionism in the United States. I'm suggesting that this is one consequence of the absence of an adequate critical theory of capitalist modernity today. The absence of such a critique opens the door to concretistic forms of anti-capitalism and populism, many of which are essentially anti-Semitic. The problematic of history, the Holocaust and anti-Semitism then, is not simply one of how those issues construed narrow are dealt with. Rather, it helps illuminate and in turn is illuminated by the structuring opposition of abstract universalism and particularism in ways that also help distinguish more adequate critiques of capitalist modernity from those that, from the standpoint of human emancipation, are at best questionable, however many people they mobilize. Thank you very much. It was a, a brilliant analysis. And we'll open it up for questions. Professor Goldberg. Um, <coughs> well, this was a fascinating, and you had many balls that you were juggling, which was too right. So I'm not sure I got all of them together. Well, but. no, no, no. But, um, but you alluded, particularly toward the end, about uh, what's going on in the Middle East today. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I would just invite you to kind of speak more about that because it seems to this me is, this is a hot shot. What else? It, it, well, no, I well, uh, it, it, it seems to me, at least at the moment, that a very fluid situation, and who knows what the dynamics are. But that the, the leadership in you know, starting with with Yemen and certainly Mubarak, uh, are seem not to be succeeding at all in in turning the villain. Uh, in the direction of Zionism, and you know they try it, um, but it, 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 at, at the moment at least, all of the blame for helplessness and for the misere that you point to is being focused at the leaders within the countries themselves. Absolutely. So it sounds like there's a different dynamic I that's so. playing itself out. I think there's a tremendous break, historical break, is occurring right now. I, I don't know how it'll end up, one never knows. You know, 1848 was a great break. There were revolutions everywhere in Europe, but you got with Bismarck and Napoleon III. But um, uh, so I, I do not know how it will end up. But I agree. I think what this does is it indicates the, the entrance of really, for lack of a better term, in this I mean, a revolutionary public on the historical stage in the Arab country indicates the degree to which what had been called the Arab Street was a complete reification and was part and parcel of that regime. And I think just as for years, you know, the, the East Germans developed this term actually existing socialism. They developed it to sort of make fun of Western leftists who had their heads in the clouds, whereas they were the real thing. It became reversed. And the idea of actually existing socialism became a sort of a category which said these are forms of domination that have to be analyzed. 
I think that it's time to analyze actually existing Arab nationalism. That is, everybody was so focused, which was understandable, on its anti-colonial dimension that people forgot, well, okay, the anti-colonial movement was then, what has been the situation now? And in every one of these cases, you have deep authoritarianism, you have a police state, and you have an incredible gap between the wealthy and most of the population. In addition, of course, which the newspapers talk about, you have the demographic bulge, right, that now a, a large majority of the population is under 30. And if, even for those who are educated, they have no perspective. What I found very telling is that Israel didn't play much of a role. This isn't to say that if Israel doesn't soon make peace with the Palestinians, that, I mean, this doesn't mean that, it, that suddenly the Arab public is on the side of Israel. They're not. But I think the Israel-Palestinian struggle has been kind of demoted to what it is, an Israeli-Palestinian struggle. Not, as people said for decades, the only thing the Arab masses think about is Palestine. I mean, that's been, I think, swept into the dustbin of history. But, but I could pursue the thought. I mean, your schemalization, yes. you know, which is quite interesting, um, but uh, it seems to me that it would suggest, I mean, you know, all of the elements of modern capitalism are still in place, mm -hmm. that if anti-Semitism was playing the role that you give to it mm -hmm. up until now, it would suggest that somehow all of this fervor in the Middle East would, it would get to be diverted into anti-Semitism, or put another way, when the absence of Israel as the target and Jews as the target and Zionism as the target suggests that your scheme, well, at least has to say, well, why the break now? You know, what, what, I mean, what, what has happened to this given that we're still in neoliberal capitalism? Um, I mean, you no, know, I don't know whether what I'm going to say satisfactory response to you, but let me try. Okay. Um, I wasn't saying that with neoliberal capitalism, you necessarily get anti-Semitism. What I was saying is that it becomes plausible. Um, it becomes plausible, and the more existing structures of domination are hidden, the more plausible it becomes. It can be hidden, be hidden in a variety of ways. So people said, well, Mubarak has been overthrown, there could be war between Egypt and Israel. Well, there might be. But what people don't seem to fully realize is that the Mubarak regime itself, on the one hand, of course, had peace, the cold peace with Israel, uh, cooperated a great deal with Israel against Hamas, because they're the Muslim brothers. On the one hand, on the other hand, it, it, it was precisely the pro-Mubarak intelligentsia that would whip up anti-Semitism. I mean, it was part of the system. And in a way, it was part of a legitimating ideology. It's not that, well, Mubarak is a friend kind of of Israel, and then you've got the Arab street. Mubarak and the Arab street are part of the same thing, is what I'm trying to suggest. And that the, the uprising in Cairo is not the Arab street. It's a new category. It's a, an Arab public. It's very different, and I think it's a. I think it's a remarkable. I think it's just a remarkable historical uh, moment that we're living through. So, and then in what ways is it different? Because I don't think the street really. I I had never any <coughs> idea what the street meant, other than that it sort of crowds of wild-eyed young men screaming death to the Jews or something, or death to the United States or something. But you never, I'll give you an example. I taught a book, oh, I forgot the author. I taught a book several years ago on globalization of fundamentalism. And the author went through each area of the world and was trying to relate the political economy of what was going on, East Asia, South Asia, Africa, Latin America, to various movements. Got to the Middle East, not a word on economy, nothing. 
Everything was politics and culture. When was the last time you read, until recently, any kind of real social analysis of anything in the Arab world? And this, I think, has been very strongly reinforced in the academy with the reification of the term other. And the other. And you have to respect the other. You know, it goes so far that uh, sort of well known <coughs> theorists now refer to Hezbollah and Hamas as part of the global left, um, which is, I think, deeply confused. Any other questions? Professor Reyes? I was struck by the fact that you put the U.S. and Israel into the same box, uh, which is not what most people would, would agree with. Um, and I don't know which is the chicken and which is the egg uh, in terms of uh, your overall view of the world. Um, the, the, in, the influence that Israel has on the U.S. is, is clearly very strong and not, in, not challenged. Uh, but the U.S. has lots of balls in the air. Israel is one of them. Israel has only one ball in the air, and it's its own survival, right? In a, in a rather, rather unfriendly world, as they see it, where they become kind of a garrison state. And the U.S. is supporting it, partly because the Jewish lobby forces it to do that. But it's not what it, they're not in the same box in terms of their view of uh, capitalism, their view of, right now there's been a shift from what you call um, the market economy. The state is coming back in. We have kind of a mixture now of the, uh, the view of the, uh, what we call um, the ascendancy of the market and a kind of a new view of the world of the state, which was, you know, in the, in the, in the war period, as you put it, there was a failure. And in the case of the post-war the post -war period, the state was viewed as very beneficent. And then in, after the 70s, you had kind of a rejection of the failure of the failure of the public sector. And now I think you have a, a new kind of melding. And I'm trying to relate that story to the position of the US and Israel. And I don't quite see that relationship. But see, I was speaking less of the position of the US and Israel and more of the attributed position of the US and Israel. I was talking about this as an ideology rather than analyzing actually the politics of the United States and Israel. So particularly in large segments in Europe, um, there was a whole, there was a whole um, pretty strong debate in Germany about five years ago on uh, the United States being capitalism and the Germans not. Uh, and this was in the Social Democratic Party. And then the images of the United States were actually images that you can find in Nazi journals about the Jews. So I'm talking about the way in which, now the United States obviously is extremely important in the world capitalist order. But to say the United States is capitalism has an ideological function. So I was talking about the Italy, Italy, ideological functions of Israel and the United States rather than their policies. I also think that the uh, that American policy in the Middle East is much more complicated than let's say my colleagues uh, Mirsheim and Erdbal would have to do their whole thing without being looking at the Persian Gulf. Um, which I think is, is actually disgraceful. So, if I may um, sort of picking up a bit on what Professor Burt said, but from another perspective, you spoke about the crisis in capitalism. Um, so, so through the so through the period of the 70s, through structural uh, adjustment, structural adjustment was imposed 
by the G7, World Bank, and IMF, and the crisis of the state, and sort of this notion that through neoliberal politics and the withdrawal of the state from the market, that there's more freedom. I would argue, and others argue, that this accelerated the failure of the modern nation state, particularly in the Middle East, to deliver the promise of, of development. And you have a breakdown of the state, which I think perhaps we're witnessing, I would argue, through the, through the, through the crisis of capitalism at this moment. Um, and you have, on the one hand, neoliberals pulling back, and you have radical Islamists who are who perceive the nation state as a foreign, colonial, imperialist uh, entity that needs to be abolished. And you have this sort of grassroots social movement of uh, radical Islam, which is, I would argue, filling the vacuum. And I, I, I'm concerned at two levels. On one level, they use anti-Semitism as an important ingredient to the fuel that fuels this social movement. Kawadari returned back from uh, exile two weeks ago to Egypt, and he preached to, uh, it'll be two weeks tomorrow, he preached in the square in Cairo to approximately two million people. And he spoke about marching on Jerusalem. He uses, he's not a Holocaust denier. He actually said that the Jews exaggerated the Holocaust, but he wants to finish Hitler's work. And the most pernicious forms of genocidal anti-Semitism is a part, it's connected to this movement. From the writings of Kato to, to the founders of the Brotherhood, to Ayatollah Khomeini, the Shia well, anti-Semitism has a very strong place in the, in the founding documents and writings of the, the canon of radical Islam. So where, I'm happy or hopeful, but where does the hope come from? Because I see this sort of, the one the crisis of globalization and, and capitalism, and on the other hand, this very reactionary social movement, which is using genocidal anti-Semitism, is on the move, and I would even argue there's a reluctance if not an acquiescence by intellectuals in the West to address it. I think that's true. But, uh, but it's not clear to me, I'm not optimistic, it's not clear to me that the Muslim Brotherhood is going to win. And I think that there are, the, the problem with the people who are not Muslim Brothers is that they're not organized. Uh, which is why my understanding is, at least from my Egyptian informants, which is a name of maybe four, uh, that uh, that they are asking the military not to have just a six month transition period, but a longer transition period so that institutions can be built. Because the shorter the transition, the more likely it's a Muslim world. I think that's right, I think it's up in the air. But I think the movement itself was very different than a radical Islam movement. And I think people underestimate Egyptian self understanding as Egyptian. I mean, if there's any nation state that really sees itself as a nation in the Arab world, it's Egyptians. And I think even the Muslim brothers are going to think twice before they try and march across the Sinai. Thanks. Well, I mean, there are that, but I, I, I'd love to hear you talk about uh, anti-Semitism in the United States specifically. And, and the ideology of anti-Semitism, as you understand it in this country at this moment in past times, and how that relates to your overall thesis. But it seems to me, if I just say one thing, that um, since World War II, I, I think you're quite right that there's been, in the United States as well as elsewhere, a, a crisis of agency, a sense of helplessness, and yet the status of Jews, I think Jews have not been the target for that. In, in the United States, in the way the point can see it, I think. But in any event, I, I'd just be interested in hearing your observation. Well, of, it remains to be seen what will happen. Jews tend not to be a target when a country is ascending. When things were a little iffy, right after World War II, I think that uh, there was a great deal of anti Semitism. And I think that the anti communism of the McCarthy, the House on American Activities, the Senate, what, is, what was the name of the Senate Committee? Um, no, the American American Activities. Activities. no, that's House on American Activities. Activities. The Senate had a different name. Um, I forgot. At any rate, they were pretty anti-Semitic and the great strides of the Jews really happen as the Cold War begins to... It's really the 60s. It's not so much the 50s. I mean, well into the 60s, schools like Yale were not accepting many Jews. I think they had a 5% quota. Ten. Ten. Uh, it was Northwestern that had five. 
<laughs> it's more my neck of the woods. Um, and now I don't know. I really don't know because it's so complicated in this country. Because also you have the evangelical Zionists. I mean, so just all kinds of lines get 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 crossed. And then you have the whole issue of race here, which is which just changes everything. So I don't know. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I mean, that's a good answer. <laughs> When we had the oil crisis, they were talking about putting Jews in that oil. It wasn't, when things are tough, sometimes they do find a scapegoat. And sometimes that is a Jew. You're going to find a lot of anti Semites. The question is whether it really sparks a movement or whether it remains the purview of Galliano and. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what's his name? Mad, 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 Mad Max. Uh, what's his name? The Australian. Gibson. Gibson. Mel. 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 No, but the movie was Mad Max. <laughs> Holger? Yeah, I want to ask you a question um, about change and uh, commemoration and remembrance politics, and uh, especially in Germany. Um, you said that um, Holocaust uh, for the nationalization for the stock and Sixties on seventies, and I would argue that I completely agree. I would argue that uh, that change to a universalized narrative, but with the certain side effects that that will say about sort of, uh, competition of victimhood, especially in the German case. Um, it's most prominent discourse of German victimhood. And it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. It started with the I guess with the book. Um, thing in 85. And I just want to ask you about your view on this uh, issue. Um, I used to have a sort of much more of a fingertip feel for what was going on in Germany. When I lived there and, I, and after I moved from Germany, I sort of kept a much closer touch. And now I'm just not sure. Uh, exact, I mean, you know, I can recognize or, you know, I can't finish reading what's his name.